Please open your Bibles to Leviticus, third book in the Bible. As we continue our survey through the first five books, we find ourselves in Leviticus. Last week, uh, for those of you who are here, uh, you may remember we surveyed the entire book uh, and uh, to kind of give you the general layout. And today we're going to be looking specifically at chapter one, which discusses uh, the first of the five offerings uh, that are described in the first seven chapters, the burnt offering. And as I mentioned last week, the first three burnt offerings, grain offerings, and a fellowship or peace offerings are mostly voluntary. The last two, the sin and the guilt or reparation or restitution offering are mandatory offerings. Um, now the way chapter one is laid out, uh, from especially first two verses, a general uh, introduction, kind of moving us into the book, theme of this book. Um, and um, the la- from verses three through 17, uh, there's three types of burnt offerings that are prescribed here, verses three through nine. Uh, the discussion centers on herd offerings, mainly cattle, uh, the most valuable. Uh, and then the next would be in verses uh, 10 through 13, about flock offerings, sheep or goats. You might consider that as for the middle class people. The bull was more for the rich ones. And then verses 14 to 17 addresses bird offerings, uh, doves or young pigeons for those with fewer resources. I'm going to focus primarily on verses 1 through 9 on the burnt offering of a bull uh, while briefly uh, mentioning the herd, um, the flock and the bird offerings. Uh, it's a lot of repetition here. Uh, so please uh, follow along as I read the first nine verses and then we'll pray and see what the Lord has in store for us. Leviticus chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. By the way, it's page number 139 in the church Bibles if you're using the pew Bibles here. Uh, Leviticus 1, beginning in verse 1. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. And remember, we've been looking at Exodus when you look at that Lord in caps, first L, next O-R-D in more small caps, that's a reference to God's covenant name, Yahweh. So throughout this, that's what you're going to be finding here. Verse 4, you are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Verse 8, then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. Verse 9, you are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to Yahweh. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that through your spirit, you will make this passage come alive to us who lived so many years since you gave these instructions. Please, Lord, teach us. Teach us what you have in store for us by putting this passage in your holy word. Here's you have a message for us. May your spirit work these truths in our hearts. Cause those who are hurting to be encouraged. Cause those who are proud to be humbled. And cause those who are down to be lifted up. At the end of the day, fill all of our hearts with a deeper gratitude for you, Jesus, to whom this passage points to ultimately. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Every Friday afternoon, for years, Eddie Rickenbacker, he was a World War II veteran. He walked to a Florida pier at sunset every Friday. And this was his ritual. He would carry a bucket of shrimp, not for himself, but for the seagulls. And as he entered there, the seagulls would surround him because they knew he's coming to feed them. And he would empty that bucket very quickly. And then he'd go back home, do the same thing the following Friday. Now, why did he engage in this act? 
See, Rickenbacker was actually a, an Air Force captain during World War II, and he had a dangerous experience with six of his crew members when the plane crashed. It was a B-17 plane. It, it crashed somehow miraculously. They, were, they found a life raft and they were floating. Six days fighting sharks, hunger, water, or battling on the seventh day, almost gave up hope. They're praying for a miracle. And as he was sleeping with his hat on, he felt something land on his head. It was a seagull. Somehow he managed to catch it, and the crew killed it, ate the meat, used the intestines for fish bait, and they were saved. He knew that God had rescued them with that seagull, and he never forgot that miracle. That is why every Friday until his death, he observed this ritual of feeding the girls as a way of expressing his gratitude to God for saving his life. And often when we look at rituals, sometimes for the person from looking from outside, it seems meaningless. But the significance really lies in the heart of the person observing them. For Rickenbacker, this ritual was a profound expression of his own way of saying, thank you, Lord. In some way, his ritual mirrors the sacrificial system that God had initiated. Each offering, each of these five offerings we're going to see spread over five, five to six messages. We're going to see they were designed to hold special significance, but ultimately it would still depend on the heart of the worshiper, not going through just the mechanics. The first offering instituted by God here, as we see this in this book, is the burnt offering. Why? Why list burnt offering as the first? Some, so some people believe that it's the first because it was the most familiar to all the people, right from Noah's time. In Genesis 8.20, Noah and his family, you can say these were the only ones who really lived to tell about God's wrath on the entire world. They saw both before and after. Noah comes out in chapter 8, verse 20. He offers burnt offerings. He's seen the wrath of God. In one sense, he's grateful, but also in another sense, he's appeasing this holy God whose wrath is real. Some people say that's why, because of the familiarity, that is why burnt offerings is the first. But I believe there's a deeper reason for the burnt offering to be the first in the list of five. And this is the reason. It's according to the latter part of verse four. Pay close attention to the last part of verse four. This is what God says. It will be accepted on your behalf. Here it comes. To make atonement for you. To make atonement. That's, that's, I believe, the main reason. You see, burnt offering represents the supreme sacrifice because it is only in this sacrifice the entire animal was fully given to the Lord, burnt wholly to God. That is why sometimes it's called as the whole burnt offering. Only the skin would be given to the priests according to Leviticus 7 verse 8. Now when the Old Testament was translated into the Greek language, that word was the word from which you get the, you get the English word holocaust. Holocaust, implying complete incineration, completely given to God. So the burnt offering, I believe, is listed first because of one of the main reasons, the primary one, is to make atonement. Now that word atonement, and the related word atone appears 53 times in Leviticus alone compared to 43 times in the rest of the Old Testament books. So you see the importance of Leviticus because of its emphasis on atonement. That term atonement, in English it's three words actually, at one meant, at one meant, signifying reconciliation between two parties. That's the idea, reconciliation. In relation to God, it involves the removal of our sin as His holiness cannot coexist with sin. Remember the theme of Leviticus is the holy God requires holiness from His people. But we're unholy. So sin has to be dealt with for God to dwell amongst His people. And in order for that to happen, it's only one way sin could be removed. It's through the death of a substitute which God graciously provided. So atonement involves making a payment for sin. It's also called sometimes as the ransom payment. Look at Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Here we find that the life of a creature, God says, is in the blood 
which is designated for making atonement. For, for your convenience, scripture verse is also posted there. So for the life of a creature, God says, is in the blood. And I have given it to you, if I can say graciously, to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is the blood. According to one commentator, the life of the sacrificial animal served as a substitute for the worshiper, representing a ransom payment for the death earned by sin, wages of sin. The paycheck for sin is death. So by this blood of the animal, God says, okay, there's that payment for your sin. But that's not all what atonement means. Atonement also includes the idea of purification because sin defiles us and it requires cleansing. It has the idea of wiping it out. So in that sense, atonement includes both the concept of ransom and purification. We just sang that beautiful hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. The third stanza, George Bernard wrote it this way, in that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see, for it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To pardon and sanctify me. That's ransom purification language. And in the burnt offering, the primary focus of atonement is on the ransom side. We will see as we move through Leviticus also about inanimate objects being cleansed, being purified, like the altar being sprinkled. So that has the idea of the purification. The price paid for the worshiper sins restores the relationship with God through the sacrifice. It appeases his wrath. So returning to the initial question, why list burnt offering as the first answer to make atonement? Man's desperate need is to have his sins atoned for. You may be sitting here thinking, you don't understand, my, my main need is a job. My main need is a visa. My main need is health. My main need is to pay this bill. My main need is for marriage to be fixed, my family relationships to be fixed. While those all are legitimate, I don't want to undermine the seriousness of those needs, but the ultimate need is what's going to matter for us 100 years from now. 100 billion years from now. It is where will we be for all eternity. And there's only one way we can be in the presence of God through the shed blood of a substitute. There's only one substitute. Jesus Christ. Now, the qu often question that's, that's raised last week, I touched on this too. Did people in the Old Testament who brought the sacrifices in obedience to God's word actually experience forgiveness for sins? Did they really experience forgiveness of sins? And I told you last week, yes. Yes. But let me elaborate a little bit more on that issue. I want to give credit to J.S. Clark who's uh, recently released commentary on Leviticus, superb one, uh, gave some ideas and I built on that. He, he talks about atoning sacrifice in the Old Testament can be compared with writing a check to cover the debt of sin. Animal sacrifices was that check, so to speak, with the lifeblood given in place of the sinners. The Lord graciously accepted these sacrifices, this check, so to speak, and declared the debt paid graciously assuring forgiveness to the offerer. Leviticus em emphasizes this. He shall be forgiven. He shall be forgiven. We saw those last week. But the Lord did not cash the check. Why? Because it would have bounced. Because ultimately, the lifeblood of an animal could never ransom the lifeblood of a human being. So you ask, why then did God put these sacrifices in place? This, this check, so to speak. Because he knew one day money would be placed in the account. 1,500 years from that time, according to the writing of Leviticus, that, that money would be in the form of the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But until that sacrifice occurred, these sacrifices, when brought in true repentance, because the worshiper's heart is important, circumcision of the heart, not just physical circumcision. Moses talks about that later on. That was important. But when that worshiper brought the right sacrifices following the right protocol, which we'll see in a few minutes with heart of repentance and faith, he or she 
actually experienced forgiveness, not potential forgiveness. They did, they did leave with that assurance, I am forgiven. Yahweh has graciously provided the substitute for the forgiveness of my sins. This illustrates God's remarkable grace and his love. Think about this. He is the one who has sinned, yet he ends up being the one who covers the debt of our sins. No wonder Paul exalts in this and saying in Romans 5.8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And two verses later, he would go on to say, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. Not that God was reconciled to us. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Romans 5 verse 10. So with that in mind, let's start looking at verses 1 through 9. Notice how Leviticus 1.1 1, 1 opens with this statement. The Lord, Yahweh, called to Moses and spoke to him. A literal rendering would be, and the Lord called to Moses. Some translation might have it as now or when. But and makes the connection that it goes back to Exodus. There's a con continuation there. Remember, I mentioned the second part of Exodus, that part that focused on the tabernacle, focuses on where the God of Israel was to be worshipped. That's the tabernacle, which later would be re replaced by the temple. Leviticus focuses on how this God of Israel should be worshipped. That's what this entire book is about. Leviticus concluded with the tabernacle built. And from verses 34 through 38 of chapter 40, God's glory filling the tabernacle. And even Moses could not enter. So now God graciously calls him. Now that, now that phrase there, the Lord spoke to Moses or the Lord commanded Moses, occurs over 50 times in Leviticus alone, emphasizing the significance of God's word to Moses. This was vital for the people to live as Exodus 19.60 called them as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is how you are to worship me as my people. And notice what God says, when anyone among you brings an offering, that word offering, korban, means a gift. It's a gift. You bring a gift to the Lord. Bring as your offering an animal from either the herd, referring to cattle, or the flock, referring to sheep or goats. Notice that term anyone shows God's grace. Anyone. Nobody was barred from coming. Men and women. In Leviticus 12.6 we will read, even women were commanded to bring burnt offerings for purification after childbirth. But also notice, irrespective of economic status, Later in verses 14 through 17, when you go home, you can read, even the poor who could not afford a bull or a sheep or goat could bring pigeons or a dove. Remember Mary for her purification? What did she bring? Because they were poor. So this is God's grace saying, irrespective of gender, irrespective of economic status, anyone can come. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Is what the Savior himself said. Next, in verses 3 and following, we see the command, first of all, to bring the proper animal. Look at verse 3. If the offering is a burnt offering, you are to offer a male without defect. We're not told why only a male. Could be pointing to Jesus, but certain offerings also included female goats. We read later in chapter 4, when it comes to priests, for their sins to be atoned for, they could even bring a female goat. But well, what we are told is the animal must be without defect. Without defect. Meaning it could not be injured, blind, or diseased as mentioned in Leviticus 22, verses 22 through 24. Malachi 1 also emphasizes that offering God less than the best is implying that God, you deserve only scraps, leftovers. And God is not pleased with that. In Malachi 1.8, this is what God himself said. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Absolutely not. David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, exemplified the right commitment in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 24 when he said, I will not sacrifice to Yahweh my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. This was David's commitment. The principle extends to New Testament believers too. We cannot give leftovers to God. It would be like giving a broken toy 
to a child at Christmas when he can afford a new one. As one commentator put it, there is no legitimate claim to commitment if there is no costly consecration to God. No legitimate claim to commitment if there is no costly consecration to God. The second part of verse 3 emphasizes the proper place to bring the sacrifice. Notice, you must present it at the entrance of the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. Remember, we're going to show this little picture that we've seen uh, throughout uh, Exodus 2 that there's the tabernacle layout. You see that's in three parts there. You got the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, which only the high priest could go once a year. Second part is the most holy place where the priests could go. And then outside, if you notice, there's a bronze basin for priests to wash their hands and feet. But then notice right at the entrance, you have this altar of burnt offering. So as people come in, first thing they will see is that altar of burnt offering, meaning I cannot enter the presence of a holy God without sacrifice. So these animals would be brought somewhere close to that would be slaughtered, and then they would be burnt on that burnt offering. Uh, another follow-up slide gives you the kind of overall picture. All you see is that the, the altar of bronze, that burnt offering, standing there, symbolic. It's only through sacrifice people can come. They cannot enter the most holy place, but they're still in that vicinity. So they can see the nearness of God. I have to approach him. The sense of holiness. And there's this altar of bronze, which is about four and a half feet high and seven and a half feet long and wide. That's the direct slide. That is the, that's where they would put these sacrifices to burn them up and it would be consumed by fire. Whole burnt offering as they see the smoke go up. The worshiper, if he brought the sacrifices with the right heart attitude, would say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The priest would first inspect the bull to make sure it's not defective and that way the offerer wasn't guilty of bringing a flawed animal and he did not let it pass through and become guilty himself. But again, a sincere heart was essential for the offerer to be forgiven. He could bring the best bull, but still if his heart was not right, he would not experience forgiven. One commentator put it this way, although God's acceptance requires proper ritual, final acceptance of the sacrifice by God depends on the moral, spiritual state of the offerer not the worshiper doing the mechanics correctly for, and then he quotes Proverbs 15, 8, the Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked. Bring it to our day and age. We can write a big check to God, but if Monday through Saturday we live wicked lives, that offering, we can even serve in the ministry, that is detestable in God's sight. He looks at the moral and spiritual state of his people. Are these my people who want to pursue holiness, convicted by their sin, broken over their sins, repenting, blessed are the mourn, those who mourn for they, and they alone will be comforted, the spiritually poor. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice what the offerer had to do. Next, verse 4, you are to lay your hand. It's the, the idea lay your hand is not just a gentle thing. It's kind of leaning over, pressing on the head of the burnt offering. That symbolized ownership, this is mine, but also had two deeper meanings. Number one, identification, saying that, you know, this is the one that I'm giving. It's like me as a substitute, but also it has the idea of possibly transference, indicating I'm transferring my sins onto this animal, which will very soon die in my place. In my place condemned, he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior we have. This connection between the offerer and the offering, in this case the animal, was crucial for receiving God's favor. And when all regulations were followed, the offerer could be assured of this promise, the last part of verse 4, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. All things in place, there is true atonement provided for that worshiper. Notice what else the offerer had to do after laying on his hands on the bull. Verse 5. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Now just imagine this scene. The worshiper has got one hand on that bull's hand, kind of pressed down, even leaning if needed. He would use the other. Other hand would have a knife. He would slit the throat of the animal. Blood would splash 
on his robe, on his feet, on his hands, all over him. And the priest then would collect the blood in a bowl, perhaps splash it on all sides of the altar. Witnessing this, what do you think the worshiper would be thinking if you were to make a guess? Be something along these lines. That should have been my blood. That's what I deserve for my sins, for my rebellion. But God, in your mercy, Yahweh, you have spared me. And that conviction would be converted to a deep gratitude that would move him to surrender himself completely to this great God as he surrenders the entire animal to him. It's a spirit of genuine repentance and faith would be increased even more. Notice what the offerer and the priest had to do next, verse 6. You, referring to the offerer, are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Verse 8, then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. Notice something here. When it came to the slaughtering, skinning, and butchering, the offerer had to do it himself emphasizing the high cost of sin. But when it came to the altar, only the priests were to manage that. So there's again, there's a little distinction there. Next, observe what the worshiper, worshiper and the priest did finally, verse 9. You, again meaning the offerer, are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water to remove all filth, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing. To the Lord. God's reaction here is described in human terms. Psalm 50 verse 13, God says it's not like I'm going to eat actually the flesh of the animals and drink the blood. It's, it's God's way, described in human terms to illustrate his pleasure with the worshiper. You came with the right attitude. You believed my word. You brought, you brought the right sacrifice with the right attitude. Everything is done in obedience to my command. It's pleasing to me. It's pleasing to me. And that because of what you did, I will look on you with favor. I'm going to grant you forgiveness. Verses 10 through 13 emphasize if the burnt offering is from the flock, meaning sheep or goat, it also had to be without defect. And again, when it was offered properly with the right spirit, look at the end of verse 14. It would be an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Same, same statement. You come down to verses 14 through 17 about bird offerings, just a pigeon or a dove. Again, when it's done properly. This time there is no without defect because it's probably a little different in, in nature, the uh, birds. Again, it would be, verse 17, the end of it says, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Whatever you can bring, rich or poor, you follow my word, come with the right heart attitude, I will accept it. That's the gracious nature of our God. Not give what you cannot in keeping with your means. Provision is open for all people. But all these sacrifices illustrate the significant truth. Sinners deserving death can approach a holy God only on his terms through a sacrifice he graciously appointed. In Leviticus 1, the point is those who are forgiven through the means of a substitute that God graciously provided must be willing to give their all to him as the animal was given fully, whole burnt offering. They are to give themselves completely. Today we no longer sacrifice animals for atonement. Why? Because animal sacrifices were a temporary means established by God for forgiveness. Jesus is that ultimate burnt offering that all these sacrifices pointed to. Let me show you from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, again for your benefit, it's laid out there, verses 4 through 10. First of all, in verse 4, the writer puts it this way. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why the check wasn't cash, so to speak, because it would have bounced. Verse 5, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. There's the Messiah talking about, I'm coming in flesh and blood. You've designed because human beings who have sinned, needs a human being as the perfect substitute. So I'm coming, the Son of God, taking on flesh and blood. This is the incarnation here. And verse 6 says, A body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. 
Why does he say he was not pleased? But Leviticus 1 says it was a little more pleasing to the Lord. The idea is in the ultimate sense that would not satisfy a holy God's holy wrath. In the ultimate sense. It was temporary measure. But then verse 7, then I, referring to the Messiah speaking, then I, it's quoting from Psalm 40 verse 6, 6 through 8, then I said, here I am, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and burnt, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Meaning, that's not going to bring the complete end to sin. As a, as a payment. Then he said, verse 9, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside. That word, sets aside, has the idea of putting to death. I think, from what I read, that the ESV comes closer to convey this message where it says, does away. Does away. The first to establish the second. When Christ died, the Old Testament sacrificial system died with him. And by that will, verse 10, we have been made holy. We've been made. This is something done to us through Christ. Through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus fully atoned for our sins. He is that ultimate burnt offering because he gave himself completely. Offered himself unblemished. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says, unblemished. In him was no sin. The Bible talks about that. He committed no sin, for Spirit 2.2, 2. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin or became a sin offering for us so that we would receive a right standing before this holy God. Jesus is that final burnt offering. That's why the Apostle John says this in 1 John 2.2. 2. He, referring to Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world world, not just for Jews, Gentiles, everyone. In Ephesians 5, verse 2, the last part, this is a beautiful phrase. Paul talks about believers. He says, imitate God, walk in love. And then he says, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Don't miss that statement, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Doesn't that connect to Leviticus 1? With that phrase, aroma pleasing to God. Jesus is an ultimate fragrant offering to whom all those burnt offerings pointed to. The Father is fully pleased with Jesus' sacrifice. How do we know? The resurrection is the proof. The resurrection, it's been said, is the amen of the Father for that it is finished cry of Jesus on that cross on Good Friday. That is why, folks, because Jesus has done it all. We are called to lay all our sins, all our guilt, all our shame on Jesus because he bore it all on the cross for us. For those of you sitting here today who are still far away from Jesus, or you might have been going to church all your life, but in your heart, you know you're far away from Jesus. You're still living in sin and despair and without any hope. Let me encourage you. You don't have to stay that way. This Thanksgiving, you can accept Jesus' gift of forgiveness, God's gift of forgiveness through Jesus. You can lay all your burdens on Jesus by turning from your sins and turning to him. He will welcome you with open arms. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all your sins. He will give you a new heart and a new life. The Holy Spirit will start changing you from the inside out. He will help you Treasure Jesus and obey him wholeheartedly. So please, please turn from your sins. Surrender to Jesus. Let this Thanksgiving be a life-changing Thanksgiving for you. Let this story of a true conversion of a man who understood the concept of the Old Testament sacrifice, how they could lay all the guilt and shame and their sin on his offering, move you as it moved him. His name was Charles Simeon. He was a notable Christian figure from 200 years ago. He lived in England, ministered for 50 years in the same place. Simeon's legacy continues even to this day through the Charles Simeon's trust, which trains individuals to become better Bible expositors and preachers. Simeon's conversion journey actually started when he was at the age 
19, he arrived at Cambridge. And there he was invited to the Lord's Supper, which filled him with great fear because he knew participating unworthily could bring great judgment on him. He went through the first communion, through the motion, but deep inside he knew he was still unchanged. But then he started to seek understanding through a, at that time it was a Bishop Wilson, through his writings, started slowly beginning to have an impact on him. In an article titled, Brothers, We Must Not Mind a Little Suffering, John Piper describes Simeon's conversion the way he himself wrote, Simeon himself wrote. This is what he said. In Passion Week, that's the week leading up to Easter, Good Friday Easter, as I was reading Bishop Wilson on the Lord's Supper, I met with an expression to this effect, that the Jews knew what they did when they transferred their sin to the head of their offering, laying on of hands. See the connection there. The thought came into my mind, what? May I transfer my guilt to another? Has God provided an offering for me that I may lay my sins on his head? Then God willing, I will not bear them on my soul one moment longer. Accordingly, I sought to lay my sins upon the sacred head of Jesus. From that hour, peace filled peace flowed in rich abundance into my soul. And at the Lord's table in our chapel, I had the sweetest access to God through my blessed Savior. My substitute, your substitute, hung on that cross, shedding his blood, invites us, lay your burdens on me. I'm here to forgive you. This is why I came. You don't need to hide from me. You don't need to be ashamed. I know everything that goes on. I know more about you than you know about yourself. Come. Come. Friend, you too have that same access that Simeon had. Leviticus 1. All sins laid on. An animal substitute. We don't have an animal substitute anymore. We have the Son of God himself as our substitute. Lay all your burdens. Lay all your shame all your guilt, all your fears, all your doubt. Come, come, drink of the water Jesus gives. Experience life, true life, through the one who said, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. You can have that same peace. You're not called, I'm not called to carry our sin burden. Jesus says, lay it all on me. I've borne it all for you on that cross. Come, find rest in me. Please, respond to this loving invitation. And for those of us who by the grace of God have been moved by the Spirit to lay all our burdens on Him, Jesus' as atoning sacrifice calls us, based on Leviticus 1, to do this one thing. We must surrender ourselves, both body and mind, in totality to Himself and live in a way that pleases our God. Live Our lives should be a fragrant offering to God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Where else can we go other than Romans 12 that captures this, this implication for our lives so clearly? Therefore, Paul says, I urge you after 11 chapters of describing humanity's sin and what Christ has done and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, he says, therefore, pulls it all together. He says, I urge you, coming alongside, pleading with you, encouraging you, brothers and sisters, in view of this, God's great mercy is shown to you through the death of Christ, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In the Old Testament, they brought living animal and put it to death on the altar. Here, Paul says, you were dead. Christ gave you life. Now lay your life on that altar, so to speak, and live for him. But not just the bodies. Just look at verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't let the world influence you. You are in the world, but be not of the world. But be transformed. Continually being transformed is the idea. By the renewing of your mind. Our bodies follow what our mind dictates. So it says continual change of mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The kind of life that God wants you to live. Both mind and body in totality. We're two-part beings. Totality. Give yourself completely as a living sacrifice. Not when you feel like it, but continually. That is the kind of life that's a fragrant offering to God. Listen, the Bible's call to God's children is clear. 
forgiven people should fully surrender themselves to the Lord's will, no matter the cost, because he paid that ultimate cost with his blood. If the Old Testament believer, living before the cross, brought a burnt offering to be wholly consumed on the altar as an expression of complete surrender to God for the forgiveness of sins, how much more should we as believers after the cross, where Jesus gave himself fully, that he fully bore the weight of God's wrath on our behalf so that we would never even taste one drop, be willing to offer our entire lives in gratitude to him. Even if he had a thousand lives and we give it, still not enough, is it? Shouldn't our constant prayer be, Lord, help me surrender more and more completely to your will? If Rickenbacker was so thankful for his seagull's death, for him and his crew's physical survival, how much more thankful should we be for the everlasting life we have as a result of the death of Jesus, the Son of God himself, for our sins? I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us believers as we go forward to hold nothing back. No turning back is what the song reminds us. Cross before me, world behind me. No turning back. And I also pray that the Holy Spirit will work in our hearts as he worked in Abraham's heart, who when called by God to offer his only son Isaac as a burnt offering, Genesis 22, as a burnt offering, did not shrink back, but pressed in obedience and even called that very act of slaying, plunging the knife into his son. It's a burnt offering as an act of worship. We will worship you, he tells his servant, and come back. Worship? God? He says, yes, you gave me the gift of Isaac, but nothing is precious to hold back from you. Jesus said, you love father, mother, wife, husband, children, even your very own life above me, you are not worthy of being my disciple. It's all on the altar as we often, until all on the altar we lay, there is no, there is no true meaning to the song, trust and obey. Let's lay it all on the line for the one who gave us all for us. The love of Christ should compel us to look for the one who gave us all for us. Father, I pray that your spirit will work in our hearts Grip us, not just with an opinion, but with a deep conviction that Jesus is worthy. I pray, Lord, even those who are far away would be drawn by your spirit to see the beauty of Jesus on that cross. To pardon and sanctify me. It was on that cross, Jesus. Jesus suffered and died. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. Forgive us our sins. Forgive me. Who am I to even preach this message to lay it all on the line? But I pray that you do a deep work in my heart and not just in mine, but in all of our hearts. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.